Aloha, everyone, and welcome to the lecture on bone tissue for Anatomy 1 here at Chaminade University. Today we're going to be talking about bone tissue, which is a very important part of the skeletal system. So I'm going to back up and give you a quick overview of the skeletal system and the major roles that the skeletal system provides. One, it provides support for the entire body. Two, it protects the internal organs, the brain and the heart, etc. It also is going to aid and assist in body motion. Now, obviously, it's going to do that in conjunction with muscles um, and nerves that are going to fire those muscles. It's also going to be involved in the storage and release of different calcium salts and phosphorus salts, so different salts that are going to be necessary to maintain homeostasis. And it's going to be involved in blood cell production. That's called hemopoiesis, poiesis being creation of, hemo being the blood cells. And it's going to help store triglycerides in the fat cells, so in adipose cells, and that's going to be in the yellow bone marrow. So let's talk about the anatomy of the bone for a second. So the bone shaft is called the diaphesis, and at the ends of the bone, we have two epiphyses, one on each end, where it's going to articulate with another bone at a region called the joint. Connecting the diaphesis and the epiphyses, we have the metaphesis region, and that's going to be the region between the diaphesis and the epiphysis. At the end of the epiphysis, we have articular cartilage, and that's going to lead us directly into the joint. We also have periosteum, which is any connective tissue that surrounds the diaphesis, or the shaft of the bone. Inside the diaphesis, we have what's called the medullary cavity, which is a hollow space inside diaphesis, which um, we're going to see is going to help create the red blood cells, and where the bone marrow is going to be located. And we have what's called the endosteum, which is the membrane that lines that medullary cavity. So it's going to be a membrane that's actually going to help separate out that hollow space within the diaphesis from the diaphesis itself. It's called the endosteum. And this is everything that I just told you, but in diagrammatic form. So this long region here is the diaphesis. The diaphesis is connected to the epiphysis on the proximal end and on the distal end by the metaphysis. All right, um, at this end here, we're going to have the articular cartilage is going to be where we are articulating with another bone. And here is the articular cartilage again where we are articulating with another bone. It's going to be creating joints. Um, so this is the long bone here, obviously. This is the long bone of the humerus. So this is going to be the shoulder joint, and this is going to be connecting here to the elbow joint. Um, in the diaphesis, the external part is going to have that compact bone. Uh, and then inside that, we have the medullary cavity, which is going to be lined with this specialized structure called the endosteum. On the outside of the diaphesis, we have a region called the periosteum, you can see it folded back here, and that's going to be the connective tissue that line up with the long bone. Now we have four major types of bone cells, osteoprogenitor cells, and as you see the word progenitor, that's basically generally going to be something that creates something, in this case it's stem cells. Osteo meaning bone, so osteoprogenitor cells are going to be bone stem cells. And they're going to be able to differentiate into the three other types of cells. So these stem cells are going to be what we call undifferentiated, and that means that they have the ability to become multiple different things if they enter down different lineages. And they can enter down whichever lineage is in need at that time, including the osteoblast lineage. And osteoblasts are going to be bone building cells that secrete the matrix. So the blast, even though it sounds like blast should break things down, blasts are actually building things up. So you can remember that B is for a building. So osteoblasts are going to build the bones um, that are going to, I'm sorry, they're going to be the ones that secrete the matrix, which actually is going to build the bone. Um, osteocytes are mature bone cells. And osteoclasts are going to be the opposite of osteoblasts. So clasts, you can remember, clasts means they're taking the calcium, which means they're remodeling the bones. So osteoclasts are going to be breaking down bones or remodeling bones, and it's going to cause them to release calcium. And it's constantly a battle or like a, um, a balance between the osteoblasts, which are building up the bone, and the osteoclasts, which are releasing the calcium and breaking down the bone. And that's happening all around the osteocytes. All right, so this is the osteo progenitor cell, again, this is a stem cell that it can develop into anything, but in this case it's going to develop into an osteoblast, right? Osteoblast is going to be responsible for building up, remember B, so building bone. Osteoblast is going to build the bone extracellular matrix. Um, the osteocytes are the bone cells themselves. They're responsible for maintaining the bone tissue. You can see they kind of look like, a, like they've got their own scaffolding, and that's so they can have the bone extracellular matrix around them when it's created, again, by the osteoblast. 
Um, and then from the white blood cell lineage, so a totally different blood cell lineage, um, we've got here the osteoclast, which is going to be helping to um, break down the bone extracellular matrix. So it's equal and opposite partner to this osteoblast, which is going to help form the extracellular, extracellular matrix. And this is what that looks like on a scanning electron microscope. I know they look very similar, but there are different markers that we use to differentiate them, and they obviously play different roles as well. All right, so if we're looking at bone histology, we have two major different types of bone. One is compact bone, and that's going to look fairly solid. Right? It's very strong, and it's going to help provide protection and support. It's actually going to grow under pressure, so if you utilize your bones to carry heavy weights all the time, it's going to end up getting stronger and stronger over time, or it can anyway. The compact bone can grow as you use it. Um, and then the spongy bone is this region in here. It's lightweight, so it doesn't weigh very much, and it's also going to have regions inside that we can provide tissue and support. So it's going to be where the um, osteoclast and the osteoblasts are going to be located. Now, how are we going to feed the bone cells with blood and nerves? Well, glad you asked. So, we have arteries that are periosteal arteries. They are going to be accompanied by periosteal veins, and they're going to enter into the diaphesis through the Volksmann Canal. So, let me go back just a second. Right? They're going to be entering in through these little holes here. This is nutrient artery. That's going to go through that canal that we were just talking about called the Volksmann Canal. Um, nutrient arteries are going to, um, I'm sorry, that the nutrient arteries are going through an alternate route, I apologize. The nutrient arteries enter through the nutrient foramen, which is a small hole, I, I knew that that was wrong. So the nutrient foramens look like this, here, and that's where the nutrient artery and the um, nutrient veins are going to be leaving. So there are two major ways in which we can get the arteries and venous return that happens to the periosteal regions which are going to go through Volkmann's canals and the periosteum, and then the nutrient artery enters the nutrient foramen that I just showed you, and the veins are going to exit through that same um, canal. We also have arteries and veins that are going to serve the metaphesis and the epiphysis separately, um, and so they're going to have their own arteries and veins. And that's what this looks like. So here's the epiphysis right here. Again, it has an epiphyseal artery and an epiphyseal vein. There's an epiphyseal line. This is actually known as a growth plate, and this is one of the ways by which people can tell. Um, for example, if someone comes in with a broken bone, and they have to decide whether or not to put in a metal rod or to cast it up. And they'll decide how well the individual has grown based on the well, how the epiphyseal growth plate has um, condensed. So when in a child, it's going to be much thicker, and in an adult, it's going to be just a line. Um, anyway, that's going to separate the epiphysis from the metaphysis. You'll see there is no crosstalk between their arteries or their veins. Here's the metaphysial artery and the metaphysial vein, again, on this side. We also are going to have these nutrient foramens here that I depicted a little while back that are going to end up um, in the diaphesis region, which is the long bone region, bringing through the nutrient vein and the nutrient artery. Um, another place is the periosteal artery that's going to go right through the periosteum, which is the region that's going to surround the diaphesis and be the connective tissue, and that's going to be here, the periosteal vein and the periosteal artery going through the periosteum. This here is a depiction of the shin bone or the tibia. All right, so how is bone formed? Bone is formed by a process called osteogenesis or ossification, and it forms in four situations forms normally during embryological and fetal development. Um, and then there's a growth spurt that happens just before adulthood. So as I just mentioned, the epiphyseal growth plate is the way that they determine whether or not you have um, finished growing. And if it is compacted, then you have. And if it is still elongated, then you are still growing. Um, and any time that the bones have been broken, so when fractures are healing or if bones need to remodel, then we're going to have bone growth or ossification or osteogenesis with bone, bone formation, essentially. Um, there's two major forms of ossification. One is intramembranous, or inside the membrane, um, and the other is endochondral. And intramembranous ossification is what happens if you're inside a connective tissue and it's going to be replaced by bone. So inside your flat bones, a region that was a connective membrane is going to be replaced by bone tissue. And this is going to reduce your ability to have a little bit of motion in those regions, but it will end up with an increased support as well. Um, this is showing what happens during bone formation here in a child, um, and this is basically showing that we have first an ossification center, and that's going to be here. It's going to be surrounded by mesenchyme cells, um, and then inside that center, it's going to be these osteoblasts. Again, blasts are going to be building up bone, and they're going to be secreting the extracellular matrix, which will eventually ossify into bone. The second step is the calcification. So basically calcium has to come in and other mineral salts are going to come in and they're going to be deposited in that extracellular matrix 
which means that extracellular matrix is going to calcify or harden, and that's the process, beginning of the process of ossification. The next thing that has to happen once it has hardened is that we have to end up with trabeculae. And you may have heard that word before um, in other lectures, but basically that's going to be little regions of holes that allow for a network. So that's going to allow these specific holes, these trabeculae, to fuse to form what we previously have seen as spongy bone in the adult. Um, and spongy bone tissue is going to be on the center, obviously, of the compact bone tissue on the outside. And then surrounding that, we're going to have the periosteum here. Um, and that's going to be the final stage, is the development of the periosteum, which is going to happen from mesenchymal cells at the periphery of the bone. Now again, this is more of a development class, so I, I don't quiz you extensively on development, but because we are talking about bone formation, I want to talk about the specific type of bone formation, and basically what has to happen is we have to have the cartilage in the developing embryo replaced with bone. And that process, again, is called ossification, and there's multiple different steps. I'm not going to go through all of it with you, but basically with the, the precursors to the diaphesis, the epiphesis on the proximal end and on the distal end, are going to first start elongating, and then we're going to end up with an extracellular matrix in the center that is not yet calcified. And then um, we're going to end up with calcification, which is our next step. So we have cartilage, and then the cartilage starts to get calcified. Then we end up with little holes that are going to allow us to have orientation where we have an ossification center here. And at this point, bone tissue is, replaced, um, has, is replacing most of the cartilage. And then last but not least, we're going to have the development of this medullary cavity, that central region, which is going to involve the breakdown. So that's going to be osteoclast. Remember, clasts are pulling calcium out, C for calcium, and that's going to help break down the bone, which is going to be forming the medullary cavity. It's going to basically be eating away to create that medullary cavity. Um, after this, we're going to have secondary ossification centers that are going to happen in the... Um, in the ephesial area. Again, the ephesium is going to be separated by that ephesial plate, and so we're not going to have any of the same capillary innervation or innervation. The same way of that, we're going to have a secondary ossification center, so that's going to happen separately over here. And then eventually, we're going to end up um, around the 12-week range, we're going to end up with calcified bones that are coming in. Not entirely, but we've started calcifying most of the cartilage around the 12-week form of the fetus. So this happens also a little bit later in life as they um, as the long bones grow in length. And here you have the epiphyseal plate. Again, that's going to be the region that separates the epiphyseum from the metaphysis, from the diaphysis. So this is the femur here, and the epiphyseal plate is here shown in a femur of a three-year-old. You can see it's much wider than what we saw previously when I was looking at the adult tissue. And here's the developing bone. This is the zone of calcified cartilage. This is a zone of hypertrophic cartilage, and hypertrophic just means larger in size. And this is a region of proliferating cartilage. This is growing bone. So this is the epiphyseal side, and this is the diaphyseal side. You can see that this region here is very wide because we have a very large region that's proliferating, and then a region that's hypertrophic, and then a region that's calcifying. And as I mentioned, eventually, when we have stopped growing, this is just going to become an epiphyseal line and not that large growth plate. So how do bones thicken? Again, we have osteoblasts and osteoclasts. B for building, C for calcium, or breaking down. So osteoblasts are going to build up the extracellular matrix, and the osteoclasts are going to break it down. So it's a constant remodeling. So again, it's a cooperative action. So here we have the periosteum. And the periosteum is the very edge of the bone, as you remember, right? And if the bone needs to be expanded a little bit to thicken, then what first is going to happen is we're going to have to bring in this periosteal blood vessel. And we do that by having these periosteal ridges that are going to come together and then seal until we have an endosteum, right? So now it's actually on the inside instead of being on the periosteal region. Uh, so the periosteal rid ridges are going to fuse, and that makes this tunnel, which what was previously the periosteum has now become the endosteum because now it's entirely internalized. But it's going to serve the same structural purpose. It's going to be lining that region. Then we have osteoblasts here. Again, they're in the oste um, endosteum. And they're going to be building out these concentric, what we call laminae. And they're going to build them inward towards the center of the tunnel, and that's going to make a new osteon. So what does an osteon look like? An osteon kind of looks like a cross-section of a tree trunk. So we have these rings that are going to be growing out from an osteon. And then around multiple osteons, we're going to have the region called the circumferential lamellae. And that's going to be the region out here. And then outside, the whole thing, again, lining the entire di um, diaphesis is the periosteum. All right, 
And that's how bones are going to get thicker um, by the action of both osteoblasts and osteoclasts. So what happens if we break a bone? So a fracture is when we break a bone. And we can have a couple different types of fractures. And we also have several different healing phases. Now the very first phase is an inflammatory phase. That's called the reactive phase. And then we get into the reparative phase where we're going to make a um, cartilaginous callus. So instead of making bone, first we're going to make the fibrocartilage. And then we're going to replace that with bone, similar to what happened during embryonic development. And then we're going to have a bone remodeling phase where the callus is actually remodeled such that it's going to look like the bone looked like, hopefully, looked like before the break. So this is what happens. So here we have the reactive phase. Here we have broken, here we have a, a fracture hematoma. You may recognize the word hematoma. Hematoma just means kind of like a, a region or a blood lesion that's going to be kind of like a blister, a blood bubble. And that's going to be from the result of this fracture. Clearly. The periosteum is going to be the region that's going to be on the outside of the bone, and hopefully it's going to keep that fracture hematoma in place. So you'll note that the blood is actually contained with peri in, within the periosteum. All right, so the next phase is that inside what was blood, we're now going to be making spongy bone trabeculae. So we're going to be making fibrocartilage, making this nice callus region. This is pretty strong, but it's not bone, right? And also it's oddly shaped because it's going to go all the way out to wherever the blood was, underneath the periosteum. So we're going to have a nice lump here. Um, and then eventually we're going to end up with vasculature and ossification. So we're going to have the creation of new blood vessels and what was spongy bone trabeculae and that um, fibrocartilage is going to become a hard callus that is actually ossified and eventually a healed fracture where we've gotten down to at least similar to what the bone looked like before the break. And that last phase is the remodeling phase, whereby the blast and the class are going to kind of play off of each other to eat away what they don't like and rebuild it until they do like it. Um, some different types of fractures. So an, a compound fracture occurs when it's actually broken through the skin. So when the bone you can see here not only breaks off from the piece of bone, but actually breaks through the muscle tissue and then out through the skin. That's an open fracture or a compound fracture, and this is a particularly dangerous type of fracture, particularly if you don't have access to medical system, because it's going to allow microbes from the outside or infectious agents from the outside to enter in perhaps directly into the bone marrow itself, but certainly into the wound, and that, that's going to possibly impede wound healing. Um, a comminuted fracture is a pretty nasty type of fracture as well because basically we've splintered. So instead of having a nice clean break that the surgeon can just put back together and then put a rod in or put some screws in to hold it into place, maybe even just cast you, um, instead of that we're going to have a lot of fragments of bone that are going to have to be individually put in or individually removed so that we can allow for the repair. Um, otherwise you will end up with fragments of bone um, underneath the skin later on after the healing, right? For example, this might be left after the whole thing ended up healing up. So an untreated comminuted fracture can be disfiguring forever because sometimes it will end up with a shortening injury, right? If you compact it from here and moved everything up and then it healed there, it would end up with a shorter limb, for example. Um, a green strict a green stick fracture is so named because it's the same thing as having um, broken a stick for the campfire and finding out that it's green inside and so it won't break all the way through. It's still kind of strong. So the green stick fracture is not all the way through generally. Um, and what's nice about that is that this is something that might lend itself well to casting instead of major surgery. You might just have to reset it um, and, then, uh, cap and then cast it. It would be something you'd have to watch though because it could end up re-injured if they weren't being very careful with that region, obviously. Um, an impacted fracture is definitely going to be one that's going to cause a bone shortening or a limb shortening if it's left untreated. Basically what happens with an impacted fracture, it's similar to the comminuted fracture um, in that the regions are going to break off, but they're then going to impact one another. So it's going to actually go inside, the piece of the bone is going to go inside the other bone, um, and that is going to end up healing. Um, with a much shorter limb if it's left untreated. So an impacted fracture will have to be extended back out before it's reset. Uh, and if someone would try to, for, for example, walk on this injury, this would be unable to support weight. It might feel like they could for a step or two and then end up becoming a comminuted fracture. All right, um, so a, a particular fracture that happens in the ankle is called a POTS fracture, and it's going to happen at the very bottom um, of the, the fibula. So the tibia is the weight-bearing bone that runs from the knee all the way down um, to the, the ankle. 
And the fibula is going to be a smaller bone that runs along, again, from the knee area, but it doesn't actually connect the knee down to the ankle. And with the wrong type, it happens with runners or hikers. You could step incorrectly and snap it if the weight ends up being improper, right? Because the weight can sometimes get caught and forced to be held by these bones, but then be improperly distributed from the top down. So that's called a pot fracture. Um, a Coles fracture is going to happen in the wrist, and it's going to happen mainly here, um, the connection of the radius with the wrist bones, right? It happened at the very end of the radius where it connects with the wrist bones. Bones are also very important for calcium homeostasis. So you've heard me say the word homeostasis probably a thousand times, and you certainly will by the end of this lecture. And homeostasis just means maintenance, maintenance of internal conditions, and in this case, maintenance of calcium levels. And bones are responsible for storing 99% of the bone's calcium. So the parathyroid gland is going to secrete parathyroid hormone, PTH, when calcium levels end up really low. And when we end up with low calcium levels, then we are going to have osteoclasts um, are stimulated to increase bone resorption. So if your blood calcium gets low, the osteoclasts, which are the calcium mining cells, are going to break down your bone to release calcium into your bloodstream. Um, and parathyroid hormone also stimulates the production of something called calcitriol that's going to be created by the kidneys, and that helps increase calcium absorption in the intestines. So we're going to both try to increase the amount of calcium that we can get from our bones, kind of like our banks, and then also like our, our calcium bank, and then we're also going to get the calcium that comes from our food, so kind of like increasing our income of calcium as well. So this is going to be one of those feedback loops that I mentioned previously where we have a stimulus that disrupts a controlled condition. Um, in this case, we're disrupting homeostasis by decreasing blood calcium levels. So I just mentioned we end up with a drop in blood calcium. That information is going to get sent to receptors in the parathyroid glands. And the parathyroid glands, again, they detect the low calcium, and that's going to create more PTH by turning on the parathyroid hormone gene in the control center. In this case, it would be um, in the parathyroid gland cells. So we're going to increase the amount of PTH, which is going to get secreted into the bloodstream, which then has two major effectors. In this case, the osteoclasts, which are the type of cells that are going to be breaking down the bone to release the calcium, um, and the kidneys which are going to be responsible for retaining calcium in the blood, so they're going to secrete less um, into the bloodstream, or into the urine, I apologize, and they also produce calcitriol, which as you may um, know, increases the absorption of dietary calcium. These two things taken in concert are going to lead to a response which is an increase in the blood calcium levels, which is returning us back to homeostasis when the calcium levels are back to normal, which will then end up restoring this entire um, feedback loop. All right, so last but not least, let's talk about aging in bone tissue. Um, we talked about it being a balance between osteoblasts and osteoclasts, right? So the blasts are constantly um, building things up, and the clasts are constantly breaking things down. And over time, more bone is produced than lost during remodeling when we are younger, right, through adolescence. But as we age, the rates eventually become to the point where our bone mass is going to be lost because we are resorbing more than we are creating or depositing, right? And this is when we end up with something like osteoporosis. This is a demonstration of an osteoporotic bone. You can see we have very large holes and gaps, and so these are bones that aren't able to actually maintain the weight. In fact, oftentimes, although people think you fall and break your hip, oftentimes elderly folks will actually break their hip and then they will fall because their hip simply isn't able to carry the weight. Um, and so that's one of the side effects of aging in terms of bone tissue. Thank you guys very much for listening to the end of that lecture. I appreciate your time today. Aloha and happy studying.